In this video, we're going to start Chapter 7, Considering Transient Vibrations. In many cases, we're interested in how a system responds to a long-term or steady-state input, like a motor running at a constant operating speed. However, in some situations, we want to know the response of a system during transient vibrations. So if a motor runs above resonance, we want to know the, the system response as we pass through the resonant frequency, for example. So all of the, um, the forced vibrations that we've considered in the previous chapters, we mostly focused on the steady state response. But here in this chapter, we're going to consider how do we actually um, look at the transient response in different loading scenarios. So other examples of transient responses include the response of an automobile suspension when a car hits a pothole or some sort of obstruction, um, the response of a system to shock loading, so like a weight is dropped on it, for example. Um, these responses are not periodic and um, or they are loaded for very short periods of time. So these systems are, in, are transient in nature. So for our examination of transient vibrations, we're going to limit ourselves to the undamped case to make the analysis easier. So the general form of the equation of motion in these cases is therefore mx double dot plus kx is equal to our force, our f of t, where f of t is the disturbing force that we are considering. Now here we're not necessarily considering periodic for functions, um, we're considering um, various types of functions and, and focusing on that transient response. So in this chapter, we're going to look at, um, in this video, we're, go we're going to consider the response of a spring mass system to a step function, as well as an impulse. And then in the other videos in the chapter, we're going to look at the response of a spring mass system to a ramp function, an exponential decay, and um, consider some other forcing functions. And then we will look at this method of convolution to allow us to generalize to um, even more uh, forcing function options. So first let's consider the response of a spring mass system to a step function. So consider the spring mass system here with our mass and our spring. And again, we're considering the undamped case. And if we consider a step load as shown here, we've got at time equals zero, we increase the load to F naught, and then we just keep that load constant. So here's our free body diagram, mass acceleration diagram, and we can use Newton's laws to come up with our equation of motion, and we get mx double dot plus kx is equal to f, and this applies for all t greater than zero. The solution to this problem includes the homogeneous and particular solutions. For the step input, our particular solution is f naught over k. And so the total response is a sine pt plus b cosine pt plus f naught over k. Where again, the a sine pt plus b cosine pt should be familiar from our homogeneous equation um, when we considered the, the uh, free vibration case. Now we've got some initial conditions. So if the system was initially at rest, x equals x naught of zero, sorry, x of zero is equal to zero, and x dot of zero is equal to zero. So that means our a is equal to zero and b is equal to negative f naught over k. So remember, we need to use the total solution in order to solve for our a and our b based on the initial condition. So we're using the total response here to get those. So x of t is equal to um, the expression shown here, which we can write as f naught over k times 1 minus cosine pt. So the response can be shown graphically um, here, where the maximum amplitude is twice that of what would be produced by a static load. So we have some, a system that was at rest, we apply this step load, instantaneously apply our force, um, and we get this sinusoidal response where the maximum is 2 f naught over k. And if we applied the force statically, um, we would have had a value of a displacement of f naught over k. So now let's consider what happens if the load were turned off after some time t hat. So after this time, the system would undergo free vibrations with the response given by a hat sine pt plus b hat cosine pt. And this would be valid for all t greater than t hat, where we turn that force off. 
So now we're turning the force off. There's no um, force applied anymore. So we've just got free vibrations. Where A hat and B hat are evaluated as um, at the initial conditions where T is equal to T hat, which depend on the time T hat at which the force was removed. So essentially we've got this um, response governed by our first uh, equation that we that we talked about at some time t hat we turn that force off and now at that instant whatever is happening to the system those become our initial conditions for our free vibration response going forward so the response of the mass while the force was being applied was given by f naught over k1 minus cosine pt so the diff the velocity at that um, during that time is given as this expression here from differentiating. So at a time t hat, when the load is removed, we can determine these initial conditions um, to find our a hat and b hat in our free vibration response going forward. So x of t hat is found by evaluating our displacement response at t hat, and x dot of t hat is found by evaluating the velocity response at our time t hat. So let's consider, consider some specific examples, two specific examples for, um, for this value of t hat. So if t hat were equal to 2 pi over p, where p was the natural frequency of the system, then the response would be given, uh, sorry, x of t hat is f naught over k 1 minus cosine p t hat is 2 pi over p. Um, so the p's cancel out and um, cosine of 2 pi is equal to 1, so our x at t hat would be equal to 0. Uh, differentiating we, we, and looking at the velocity response, evaluating the velocity at t hat, we have um, f naught p k, f naught p over k, sine p um, 2 pi over p, so the p's cancel out, we've got sine of 2 pi, and this is equal to zero. So again, our, so our velocity at this time is equal to zero. So this means our initial conditions, when we shut off the force, are um, a, a displacement of zero and a velocity of zero. So this leads to our a hat and our b hat equaling zero. So our response is then um, f naught over k one minus cosine pt, while t is less than our t hat, and then just zero when t is greater than t hat, if t hat is two pi over p. Now another example that we can consider is t hat is equal to pi over p. So in this case, our x of t hat is equal to two f naught over k, and x dot of t hat is equal to zero. So now we've got some initial displacement, but zero initial velocity at the time when we turn the force off. So this leads to a hat equals zero and b hat equals minus two f naught over k. So our response is then f naught over k one minus cosine pt, while t is less than or equal to um, pi over p. And then once we turn that force off, t greater than pi over p, um, we get this response here. So in case one, we've got our force or step function force turned on, we turn it off at um, two pi over p. So we get this response here. So we, we have our initial sinusoidal function or cosine function. And then right as we come back down to zero displacement and zero velocity, we turn that force off and then we get zero response going forward. For the case two, um, we just apply, we get kind of half a cycle of the first response, and then we turn that off at pi over p, and we get our free vibration response um, going forward. Now we can think about this previous response in a, um, on a physical basis. So in the first case, a force uh, F0 is applied when the system is originally at equilibrium. So when F0 is applied, the effect is to shift the equilibrium position a distance of F0 over K. 
So our, our system was initially at rest. We applied this F naught over, or we applied this F naught. So now we have a new equilibrium position. At time t equals zero, so immediately after the application of F naught, the mass appears displaced from its new equilibrium position. And if we measure the displacement from this new equilibrium position as y, and ignore both the applied F naught and the equilibrium stretch in the spring, like we did ignore gravity effects earlier, then we have free vibration with initial conditions given as y of zero is equal to minus F naught over k, and y dot of zero is equal to zero. And the response, y of t, is equal to minus f naught over k cosine pt. Now since x is equal to y plus f naught over k, where x was our original, um, where f naught over k is basically the difference from our one equilibrium position to our second equilibrium position, then we can rewrite the, we can write the system response as, um, x of t is equal to f naught over k times 1 minus cosine pt, which is the same response that we found um, before. So we can think about the two cases where the force was removed after some time t equals t hat in the same way. Once the force f naught is removed, the equilibrium position returns to its original position and that time t hat determines the initial conditions for the subsequent free vibration problem. So in general, if the force is removed at a time t hat, the response for t for all time greater than t hat will be a hat sine pt plus cosine b hat cosine pt. And the initial conditions can be used to find a hat and b hat. And so these initial conditions depend on the time t hat when the force was removed. So the, the two cases that we considered were kind of the extreme cases, but we could choose any t hat to remove the force and whatever's happening to the system at that time in terms of the displacement and velocity would be our initial conditions for the free vibration response moving forward. So if we chose t hat is um, two pi over eight p, then we would get a response that looked um, something like this. So this is, if we just applied the force for a shorter period of time and then turned it off here, this is how the free vibration looks going forward. Um, this is for two pi over four p, um, pi over p, which is one of the cases that we considered before, two pi over p, which is another case that we considered before. And here you can see that just as we're coming back to zero displacement for zero velocity, we turn the force off and then we get zero um, response going forward. Um, this one is for two pi over p times 1.25, two pi over p times 1.5, um, two pi over p times 1.75, and then two pi over p times two. So here we get two complete cycles. And again, just as we're coming back to zero displacement, zero velocity, we shut it off and we get zero response going forward. So now let's consider the response of a spring mass system to an impulse. So an impulse is basically where we apply the force, F naught, and then after a very short period of time, we remove that force. So the quantity F delta T is the area under the curve and is known as an impulse. So if the time delta t is small, so our t hat is small, um, which means that p t hat or p delta t is much less than one. So the case where p t hat is much less than one, cosine p t hat is approximately equal to one, and sine p t hat is approximately equal to p t hat. So basically this, we're using the, the small angle approximation of sine and cosine, um, where as this goes gets small, cosine equals one, and as this gets small, sine is equal to um, p t hat, so, or, or p delta t. So the initial conditions are then approximately f naught over k, one minus cosine p t hat, which is equal to zero. So if this is approximately one, then this um, displacement is approximately zero, and the velocity is approximately f naught delta t over m. 
So um, these become our initial conditions. And then we can find our A and our B based on this. So x of t is then equal to f naught delta t over mp sine pt, and this is valid for all t greater than zero, assuming that delta t is very close to zero, very small. Now, we can also um, obtain the same results by applying the basic principles of impulse and momentum. So if the system was initially at rest, and then we apply this impulse, f delta t, we now have a system that's moving with some velocity vf. The spring force is not shown on the diagram because the force is assumed to be applied and removed so fast that there's no displacement. So this, a spring force is non-impulsive. And we saw that in the previous analysis as well, where our initial velocity, or sorry, initial position was, was zero, even after the force was removed. So it's assumed that the when you apply the, the, the impulse, the position doesn't actually change, but you do just impart some velocity. So applying the principle of impulse and momentum, we show that m um, times zero plus uh, f naught delta t is equal to mv. So this is basically the system's at rest. Um, we're applying this impulse and we get some the mass moving at some velocity vf. So this leads to vf is equal to f naught delta t over m. Um, after the impulse is over, we have free vibration response where our initial conditions were, again, zero displacement and velocity given by f naught delta t over m. So using the initial condi conditions to find the two constants gives a is equal to f naught delta t over mp and b is equal to zero. So the response becomes this, f naught delta t over mp sine pt for all t greater than zero, which is just what we found before. Uh, in equation 7.4.